Awesome, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. We've got a real treat today. We've got John with us. So last week we had Mike and he spoke about his time in prison, leaving the Ataris, uh, his experience in Versus the World and touring. The thing with Mike is his interview was very quote unquote plight. I hate to use that word, but John and I got to talking and I want to hear his point of view and see what his experience in the Ataris was like and what it's been like for him since and what he's been up to because John was one of the last members of that lineup, you could say, to Jump Ship. And that band has now had 24 members, 24 members in that band. So I'm really <laughs> excited. To you think we were a ska band. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Oh my goodness. Awesome, John. So um, I'll pass to you and, you know, you just tell us all about Columbia, those last few years with Chris, um, that funny Venice story you had. <laughs> that was um, legendary. Um, well, the first thing is it's been almost, it's almost 20 years to the day that I joined the band. Mm. Uh, it was on Warp Tour 2001. And I knew those guys since 1999. I was in another band, and that's how I met them. We were had the same booking agent. Beefcake. We, yeah, I'm a beefcake. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we toured pretty much in every little small place in America. I mean, everywhere. And it was just the two, two bands. And, uh, yeah, most of the times no one was there. And, of course, eventually little by little some people were showing up but they were obviously not showing up for us they were showing up for the ataris so it was really great to see them kind of blow up in front of me you know uh which was cool so yeah i joined them on that warp tour in 2001 i was i wound up working for them uh, mike and i had a good relationship and he was the business guy of the band always and uh he had to just ask me to come out and and like be a guitar tech kind of because i was my band was kind of just done, you know what I mean? I was kind of bummed out. And I always wanted to do Warp Tour. Everybody does. Yeah. I think that's in that scene, you know, especially back then. So I figured that would be the last thing I ever did. And then Marco never showed up to San Francisco show and I wound up filling in. <laughs> and then, I don't know if you've ever heard that story, but that's what happened. Marco partied the night before in uh, Ventura and forgot to get on the bus and we left. And at that time, not everybody had a cell phone. So like, he just, uh, he, yeah, he, he got in touch with the band at like 11 in the morning the next day. And schedules are always, you never know when you're gonna play. And of course we were played like second at like one o'clock in the afternoon. So he wasn't gonna make it. So yeah. I filled in for him, pretty funny. But uh, sadly when he got, they had to make a decision because they, they knew they were gonna sign to a major label at that point. And, uh he's a good friend of mine at that time so it was a weird situation but yeah that, that's how it, it happened but um wow yeah uh i, I can i want to i want to ask because you, you you said you were filling in for them uh because a lot of punk rock and pop punk bands use either similar chord progressions or similar keys uh i guess you picked up the parts quite quickly but was there any part where you were just like fuck it improvise yeah, a little bit. Well, the thing was that, you know, because I had done so many shows with them prior to that, I, I had, you know, I knew the songs and I knew the, the, the set, obviously, but I had never played it. I played a couple of songs before. I think everybody knew Sandy and Miss High School Football Reels <laughs> you know, at least once. So, uh, but yeah, Chris actually came uh, into the bus. Uh, we had about 45 minutes on acoustic guitars and just practice and i just said listen if i screw up i'll just pick slide yep <laughs> that's what i would do <laughs> so if i had a part that i didn't know what the hell i was doing i would just be like <laughs> yeah screw it yeah. uh so but yeah it worked out well i mean i don't think anybody really knew so uh we're, we could tell the big difference but yeah mm. it was it was a crazy time man but um that was that so where should i where should i leapfrog to and then at this point well, i can tell you about the venice thing so the funny thing about the band uh, at the time this was in march of 2004 um we were kind of coming a little bit towards the latter part of the touring for so long astoria mm -hmm. and we went back to, i don't even know why like most of the times i kind of knew what we were doing and why we were doing it 
Mm. This particular time when we went to, we, we did two weeks in the UK and it was the biggest UK tour that we had ever done. And we did it with, um, we did it with support that you would not think a band like us would take. We actually had Cursive out with us. I don't oh. know if you knew who that band was. They had like um, one of the best records in 2003 called The Ugly Organ, uh, according to Rolling Stone. And they were like this obscure indie rock band. Chris was a huge fan of the singer Tim and we literally just he reached out to them and he saw that they were playing in, in England very small tour and just said hey you want to scrap your tour and come on and do shows with us thought they would never do it and they did wow so we so it was the the thing was so this is like we had them and we had planes mistaken for stars so we had such a weird diverse lineup it's just sort of it's kind of leading you into as maybe you can see a little bit of why things started to change musically mm. for us. This was in 2004. Yeah. And, um, but anyway, so the boys of summer obviously was the, was in America, especially was really uh, on the radio presence in the summer of 2003, even through the, the fall of 2000. Really, you couldn't get rid of it. Yeah. It I remember. Like, yeah. I mean, there were, I don't know how many radio stations are in America, but they were spitting like 60 times a, a week on, on multiple stations, like all over the country. It was, it was, yeah, pretty fun. I mean, the, the good thing was, is I was on tour the whole time. So I didn't, I never even heard it really like very few times. So, but anyway, here we are, this band, we're doing the biggest tour ever in England. And uh, after that tour, I don't know why, but we, we had four or five shows lined up in, Italy, which was notoriously not a huge market for us, a good market, but not a huge market. Those were like real punk rock shows in Italy. And then someone had the bright idea to, to do one show in, in um, Austria. Yep. Uh, uh, oh, God, what's the city in Austria? The uh, uh, beautiful oh. city in Austria. Oh, my God. I'm like losing. Uh, <laughs> No, 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 yeah, no. you're in Europe right now. <laughs> now, now, that, now that you you mention it, it begins with a V, and I, yes, I was going to say Venice, and I'm like, no, that's no, not. No, it. Uh, I, I I know exactly where you mean because it's nine o'clock at night, and I'm drinking. I'm completely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like, oh my god, I gotta like, it's killing me that I'm not like figuring out. Uh, it'll it'll come to Vienna. Us Vienna. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we were supposed to play a show in Vienna, and then to do a show in Warsaw, Poland. Oh yeah. Right after that. Yeah. Okay, so but here was the deal. Because the 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 uh, money that was offered then we had to get rid of half of the crew and we could only go there by train. Oh, man. So this is a band which is funny because <laughs> here's a band that was having a pretty successful run in America had a great tour in England, this huge tour in England. Yeah. And now we have to do these, these shows in, it, uh, in Italy, which was fine, but small, but then try and jump on a train to go to uh, Vienna and then a train all the way to Poland with all our gear. Oh, okay, no. so we played, our, yeah, we played a show in Bolzano, Italy, then got dropped, literally got dropped off by two vans at the Venice train station. So there were six of us. Four band members, two crew. Uh, I think Mike had his uh, girlfriend at the time with him. And we had, I mean, like, it had to be 15 feet long worth of gear. So we're on this platform with all this gear, all of us. And then I find out that the train stop is three minutes. All right, three minutes. And this is the only train that day that goes, because it's Sunday, that went from Venice to Vienna. So anyway, the long story is when the, when the train, sh oh, by the way, was the, at that time it was in March, it was one of the worst storms Venice had ever seen rain wise. So oh. Venice was flooding. Oh, right. So it was, a disaster. it was pouring out, pouring out, but we're covered at this point, but like, I'm anxious. Everybody's like anxious of like, how are we getting all this shit on a train? And we had those seats where it was like, somebody would be sitting in front of me. So three and three, yeah, like yeah, yeah. there's no storage for eight guitars uh kid we used to uh roll with this in-ear system and a, and a thumper on a seat and oh we used to carry so much merch with us dude like huge duffel bags worth of merch anyway 
when the train came and there's, I mean, it's not like we're the only ones there. It's a, it's Venice. It's a crowded station. Mm. People are in and out. Like we're trying to get on the train. It's like kind of chaotic. I realized there's nowhere for us to put our gear. Like we're not going. Yeah. And yeah. it was just chaotic and no one was helping us. And like, we're yelling back and forth. And like, I finally was just like, I, I got off the train, dropped the shit. I said, we're not going, fuck it. I'm not going. I'm not doing this. This is crazy. Right. And of course they were, uh, Mike was deflated. He's like, Oh my God, what are we going to do? Like, we didn't know what to do, but there was no way we were going to make it on that train. So we're like disheveled. We're on the, we're on the platform. Like we're screwed. We're, we're stuck in Venice. It's Sunday. Who are we calling? We had no tour manager, right? Nothing. As the train is slowly rolling by, <laughs> Chris is in the doorway of the train like this. See you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> and he fucking, he fucking bolted it to, to, we're just i'm literally like, like dude what the where you go um, yeah he just rolled he went he went to vienna it was ridiculous what yeah that's so i mean and there we are s- stuck in venice with all this shit pouring rain oh my god and you know at that time everybody had uh, like people had flights leaving poland we had a change i mean this this isn't like I went on my phone and it was like, oh, Expedia or yeah. any of that shit. Like that stuff, you know, I didn't even have a phone. That, I think I had a razor. <laughs> you remember, well, I had one of those razor flip phones, man. I was like, I didn't have the internet on my phone. It was, I didn't, you know, I, I don't even remember if I had a laptop, even in 04. Like I wasn't rolling with a laptop as a band. Like, of course, you didn't have Wi-Fi. Anyway, man. It, it, yeah, like these days, yeah, like, we, all of the train stations have Wi-Fi and you can just do it on your computer. But I mean, back then, there was nothing. You, that's, that's so crazy. Did, did Chris go, so Chris is on the train. Did he, he on the train. Did, <laughs> did he go and play like an acoustic show? No, or? no, he didn't do it. It was, uh, we canceled it. It, it, but he just went up to the, I don't know where the hell he went after that. Like, honestly, like, I don't remember. I know that he definitely went to Vienna, but that was Chris just living, living the nomad life. Just being like, see ya. Oh, <laughs> so, but that was just uh, how chaotic the band was always, you know? And that wasn't really due to a, a specific person. And I don't even want to put it, put it on my band's man, like our old manager, who's a great guy and everything. But he, uh, I think when Mike had mentioned to you this, this kind of thing, how like he felt like the Ataris weren't like really ready for to be on a major label. Mm. And, and that's very true because when I met those guys, we were all van, punk rock, pop punk, whatever you want to call the genre. I mean, that, but that's what we did. And there was no manager and there was no business manager. And there, there was an agent, but he was some kid in his parents' house in the South Bay. And, you know, the crew were just whatever scrub, scrubby friends you had that just jumped in to party. Like you gave him a couple bucks here and there. So there was no overhead. So once, once the band had reached a point, it's kind of funny. Like, and this to me is very true. There's only two types of bands that could do anything you want when it comes to touring and that's you're either Coldplay or you too mm. or you're a punk rock band like a real punk rock band because think about it a lot of punk rock bands always were able to travel the ones that were popular right Just like because their expenditures were so cheap they didn't have all this overhead they didn't have they probably weren't paying taxes like just you know what I mean like <laughs> they probably weren't but they, they didn't have all this structure where uh 15% of your income goes to the manager and, and 30% is always taxable and insurance, man. Just think about how much insurance we paid to cover all sorts of things. Like if some Chris threw a guitar out in the crowd and hit somebody in the face, like, and they sued us or like, dude, you know what I mean? Or if the yeah. bus hits somebody, the, our insurance policies were astronomical. So it's like, these are the things that we had zero clue about, but the trade-off was, you know, Blue Sky selling about 100,000 records on Kung Fu, which was phenomenal at that time. Like, think about it. Only fat bands were able to do that stuff, right? So they were one of those bands that were able to do that and then go to Columbia and sell six, seven, eight hundred thousand 800,000 copies. 
that's the trade-off. Your name really gets out there. And you were kind of saying like more casual listeners would know who the Ataris were. Well, of course, like uh, I, I actually heard, so I went to this music school after school finished, I would go to music school in the evening and we would be taught how to play our instruments, how to learn a song, how to write a song. And one of the best examples they gave us wasn't the original version of Boys of Summer. It was your version of Boys of Summer. <laughs> that's, that's hysterical. That's how popular that song was. And like, if they'd have said to a bunch of 13 year olds, here, we're going to learn this song by the guy from the Eagles or whatever, people would be like, what? But because they used your version, it was appealing. And that was, that was really huge. And like you said, the UK tour, no doubt was big. I remember back those years, uh, I saw Real Big Fish being supported by The Matches, and I saw Weezer being supported by Tegan and Sarah. So you mentioned that you had a really weird support act. Um, that's, that's not uncommon that bands back then, because either the label or management or booking agent or, or, or just the fact that that band were friends with the, the headlining act, sometimes you'd get a, a post-hardcore act supporting an emo act who were then supporting a pop-punk act. It was, uh, it was all very up in the air back then. They definitely, the people that work for us definitely did not want us to do that, for sure. <laughs> they always, yeah. I, mean, well, I, I would always say maybe to Mike and like, hey, what, what if we actually listened to our manager? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, yeah. Maybe, maybe things would have been different, but probably not. But uh, yeah, we always... I think that's the thing about the Ataris. Um, I mean, you know, they were, this isn't a band that was breaking barriers by writing groundbreaking music. They just, you know, were, the music was just uh, something that a, a lot of people were able to kind of latch onto, right? It was, uh, so uh, I don't know. I, I kind of lost my thought there for a second. <laughs> I'm getting old, man. Yeah, I think you're, you're right, though, because uh, with Columbia Records, the promotion, it was so much. And Boy, Boys of Summer was actually, it was their decision, wasn't it, to, to promote that song. And that got so much radio play. And it just brought you to such this huge audience of uh, what I like to call like, uh, like normies. Like it wasn't just Warped Tour kids and Skate Punk kids and Mill and Colin Lagwagon kids who are listening to the music anymore, it was a whole new set of people. And even Mike mentioned that just a few days ago, he heard that song on the radio on, on Cross. I, st I still hear it too, yeah, on a local radio station. Um, yeah, it was, as Mike had told the story pretty much, uh, we put it on the record <clears> that we weren't going to, um, even our manager told us not to do it, but we had put it on it like, it, it's track 10 on that record. Yeah. No single is track 10 like no band's biggest song is track 10 there's usually one or one to four right yep. so uh it was supposed to be used for like maybe a movie soundtrack or something like that that's what they were like oh we'll use it as a soundtrack mm -hmm. song like an afterthought which was like okay that makes sense but yeah when k-rock in la started playing it and they basically forced columbia to accept that because you know, Mike, Mike, I don't know if you told your story. We actually, the four of us sat in Don Einer's office. Don Einer was the, um, the chairman, the CEO of Columbia. Mm -hmm. And he was like, kind of like a, an intimidating kind of dude. Um, it was just, it was like a surreal, it was like one of these surreal moments, just, you know, this is just four dopey dudes in this guy's office where you have Bruce Springsteen record, platinum records hanging and Billy Joel and, you know, I mean, like big artists. And then you have us goofballs walking in this guy's office. But he had promised us, when, which was, of course, um, like the music industry is like when you join the military and say, I want to do this. And they're like, yeah, just join. <laughs> and they make you do something else. That's the music industry is like, oh, we won't let them make that a single. You guys are a career band for us. And then I mean, literally within weeks, they were like, uh, do you guys have a treatment? Like, um, do you have an idea of maybe, um, you know, uh, for a video for Boys of Summer? We're like, gosh, because, you know, listen, uh, as we all know, Alien, Alien Ant Farm had a, that, uh, uh, was that Michael Jackson song, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, like, I'm not saying I was a fan of the band, but I, I've seen those guys play multiple times. They were on Warped Tour one year. Mm -hmm. They were a sick, 
sick band. They were really good musicians. They played some heavy stuff too. Like that band had so much more than just that stupid song. But you know, it's a cursing and a blessing at the same time. It's a curse and a blessing at the same time. But yeah, I mean that probably played in the hand of of uh, the demise, of course. But uh, you know, the whole and rolling into that whole thing about leaving Columbia in um, it, so in two thousand four. Uh, before I went on that tour in England, I had a little time off. I went to a studio locally, um, a guy who uh, owns it, who actually did the first My Chemical Romance record. His name is John McClario. He did the first brand new record. He had a lot. John's still doing stuff. Um, he had just opened up his new studio back then because uh, he has another new one now, many years later. But um, he had no one there. And he's like, hey, come by, check it out. You know, do you, you want to jam or something? I'm like, yeah, sure. I had some ideas, but you know, the thing is, is like the change of music, we'll go with that first. The change of music was not sudden. It was something that was coming after so long the story was done and written, meaning written and part of recording because as we started touring, um, you know, Chris, I think was delving into a lot of stuff that was, um, like he definitely liked the curse of stuff and he definitely had a love for my bloody Valentine and stuff. like. So how can a band like the Ataris be anything like that? You can't really. But at the same time, it was getting perking me into, cause I was a punk rock guy. I was like pure fat record epitaph dude for many years. Right. That was my jam, man. I, had, I always wanted to be in a band that could play, you know, super fast drums and stuff like that. Um, but once I, I broke out of that and started listening to the other things. It was just sort of like the ideas, you know, just started, you know, I didn't even know anything about pedals, like guitar pedals. I had four triple rectifiers, you know what I mean? Like that's, and, and Les Pauls, that's all I played through the guitar is those until we started changing stuff around. But like we started listening to, to different stuff and it was opening my eyes to wanting to do more right like and the thought is is you're like okay the guitarists have four records out now four records you would think by the fifth one people would figure out like hey you don't want to do this anymore <laughs> you kind of want to expand the sound maybe do something a little different it, yeah it didn't work of course that but we that's what we were attempting and it was it wasn't a thing that we just woke up and we're like, this is what we're doing. It was a slow burn. And I mean, like we were changing our amp setups in 2004. Like we started messing around with combo amps, you know, and some pedals and like just, just little stuff. But once we, once I had written a couple of those songs, just ideas, I sent them to Chris and he really perked up and he started writing a bunch of math, like stuff. And, and then afterwards in uh, late 2004, for we we were starting to get together for sessions just him and i in new york and i had met these guys at the studio that were phenomenal players not that they not that kid kid is a phenomenal drummer and mike's a good bass player but i think at the time things were getting weird like right i think everyone was sick of each other mm -hmm. as mike had alluded to he had some substance uh, problems mm -hmm. that uh, he had and um so there was a lot of unrest but between the band members but of course i was always like we gotta let's go forward i kind of was trying to take not not meaning to but i was taking over mike's spot because mike kind of was just I, he needed to take care of himself so i wanted to just continue on and we did a lot of stuff weird kind of recordings and these big uh you know just lots of wall walls of noise you know what i mean just like if if we you know we should have just changed the name back then of course but you're thinking like our fans will accept this they if they like what we do they're going to like what we do regardless so that whole mindset of of the welcome the night was again was just not something that came out of the blue it was a, a slow burn and then once kid had the issue with kid uh, wasn't i mean you know it was just a thing the three of those guys own the band name so it was really kind of a decision that was floated around a kid moving on, you know, mm -hmm. I, yes, I, I had to sign off on it as well, which was terrible. I, 
I wasn't happy about it, but I mean, it was just something that had to be done at the time. Yeah. Um, and then with Mike, Mike was just like, <laughs> Mike just, he just went with verses. He just, you know, at the time I was like, Hey man, you know, we're, we're going to be at the studio, maybe chill out, try and get your head together. And I, I Mike was just kind of like, you know what, fuck, I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's what he did. So it was never, we never were like, Hey Mike, you're out of the band. It just, it just was a weird thing. He just never came back. <laughs> I, I think, uh, Welcome the night. Interestingly, I, I still get comments on that video that I did on the Atari's a couple months ago. People are saying it's a really underrated album. It's one of their favorite albums of all time, in fact, which is really <laughs> nice. And I think that So Long Astoria was obviously different from Blue Skies. And this happens with, with all bands. Like, you know, you will go a bit more rocky or a bit more punk or a bit more pop. And it's it's perfectly natural i think that uh so long astoria was a bit more rock and punk rock than the earlier material which was kind of a bit more skate punk pop punk and then welcome the night i think kind of it was refreshing certainly um it's uh what was the the situation like with columbia was it was it awkward or was it more just like no this this feels right it's one of those things no it was one of those things where they go Oh, we totally understand what you're trying to do. But, you know, like, you know, like uh, talking heads, as artistic as they were, they had hits, yeah. right? You got a hit in there. I know you got a hit for us, you know, and then uh, that's what they were doing. And they're like, oh, the Pixies, the Pixies, you know, they, they, they were art rock, but they <laughs> had hits. Mm -hmm. That was like kind of their, that's how it was always presented to us. Um, but what re the real issues were is that um, Col Columbia and RCA were merging at the time. Mm -hmm. And when they were going to do that merge, we knew that Einer was going to leave. Will Botwin, who was the president, was going to leave. Uh, Tim Devine, who was the a &R guy, was going to leave. Um, the, all three guys were, like, in our corner. You know what I mean? Always. Especially Will Botwin, the president. He loved the band. And if we were going to lose the support of the, the top, top two guys and our A&R guy, like we knew that there was always a risk that this record could be shelved. Mm. You could be dropped. You could, uh, we could be still writing music uh, 10 years later to try and get a hit. Like it just didn't feel right. You know what I mean? We didn't know where we were going to land because at the time when we you put out a record now, of course, that record could have sold millions and we would have been in a much better situation. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have cared if we turned it on a CD and handed it in, <laughs> but because we did okay, I think it was a situation where they were like, you want to go, you can go. Yeah. Right. And that's what happened. There was never a situation where they're like, we don't want this. It just, we didn't, we didn't let it get to the point where it was a decision for them to make fully because we didn't know who was going to make that decision I mean, because the guy that we knew that made those decisions, Don Einer and Will Botwin, they were gone. They were going to, they were leaving. So we were like, well, we got to do something. Um, and so we left, but where was Tim Devine, our A&R guy, totally into the record? Probably not. I mean, he knew that the band had put out a pretty good product and that we could follow it up and probably do something similar. But, you know, I think he did understand like these guys are, trying to, uh, you know, be artistic and, you know, I guess we were musicians. <laughs> I, don't, I, I use that term lightly, but like, yeah, we were just trying to write. You know what? I think the thing is if we wrote something that sounded like so long a story apart too, at that time, it would sound like crap because we weren't, the headspace wasn't there. So, you know, we tried to write something honestly and sometimes that doesn't work out. <laughs> so, um, we had um, spoken with Warner Brothers. Oh, that's uh, cool. We had spoken with, oh God, what's the other? Um, Universal? Uh, part of Universal. Yeah, it wasn't Universal proper. It was another, uh, Interscope. Oh, okay. I was okay. going to say Interscope or maybe Epitaph. I don't know, but that, I think Epitaph is Warner Brothers. I can't remember. Yeah, it's tough. So at that time, it was really, it was Interscope and Warner Brothers. Now, I was hyped to go on Warner Brothers. Yeah, I was also 
okay with dumping the record and starting over if we had to. Nice. Um, because I, I don't think they were loving it either, but they were definitely the, they wanted us, but you know, we didn't give it up. Like it also, believe me, when we left, Columbia wasn't giving us away for free. They had, whoever was taking us was paying for that record. Wow. So um, it was a couple hundred grand, but I mean, like still, it wasn't a free thing. Like we were just free to go. So we went with this um, small imprint. Um, we made our own imprint called uh, SLA Records, um, but it was through, uh, God, I was just, yeah, it's funny. I should know this because that was another great story of how, uh, um, but it was a label out of the UK um, that had put out some Morrissey records. They put out some, uh, um, they put out, uh, God, um, some Iron Maiden stuff is, too. Is it the Orchard? I don't know. I don't think it was the Orchard, but um, huh. they, they, uh, I'm like losing my mind. I should have wrote this stuff down. But the label that picked us up was a small label, but their distributor was Sony, oh, wow. which was still Columbia. Yeah. So they paid <laughs> to get the record back to the same distributor that distributed their record. It was like the weirdest kind of deal. I felt like, and you know, I made some money off the deal too. So it's like, I felt like I got money back from, from Sony, you know what I mean? Cause Sony was funding these small little, these small labels, right? They were helping these labels out, putting out records and distributing for them. I was like, okay, you know, but uh, they took us on and the problem with that was they were much smaller. So now you're like, back to a, a smaller label that did not have the radio presence. So we weren't able to get anything really get cooking on the radio. They only had like four or five reps in America where in, in Columbia has a rep in every friggin' town. Yeah, like okay. they have people everywhere, you know, it's nuts. So. Um, the other big thing back then was also a, well, in the UK, it was Scars, Kerrang, MTV2. And I'm sure in America there was something similar. There was TRL and, um, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah well yeah we never did the trl thing because they wanted us to do boys of summer and we wouldn't do it oh, so cool. um yeah i mean it was I, I mean we fought ourselves on it you know what i'm saying like i i don't know what would happen if we fully embraced it right if we fully embraced it and just let it bloom would it still be you know what i mean uh would it still be the demise part of the demise of the band uh or would it always just be that's who we are but you know maybe we could be playing uh, uh casinos right now yeah <laughs> just play boys of summer twice that's um <laughs> yeah well, actually, you, you'd probably do a matinee performance and then a <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> the early bird special crowd yeah oh so so from two <laughs> so from 2005 to when i left in 2008 from 2005 to 2007 literally to 2007 I was in and out of a recording studio for two years. Yeah, so we lived um, in North Hollywood and we were recording in um, a house, uh, it was a pool house. And the guy, the, the original owner was uh, Steve Beccaro. He was a drummer from Toto. That was one of like, yeah. So I mean, he's dead a uh, long day. He was, a, he was an amazing uh, uh, session drummer and he had a studio in the back. And they had converted that um, into uh, a really nice guy uh, who owned a studio in Minneapolis, um, CD Underbelly. It was like a, a lot of great bands recorded there, but the most famous one was that Closing Time song. I don't know if you're familiar with that yeah, song called Closing that. Time. Yeah, yeah. The guy who was the producer of that, his name is Nick Lornay, mm -hmm. and Nick wound up re producing our record. Um, and he embraced every bit of the weirdness of it and, and tried to cultivate the weirdness even more. He loved, he loved the fact that we were some sort of shiny pop punk band trying to just put out something that would just be a complete 180. Um, and he did an amazing, amazing job of capturing what we were trying to do. But of course, he was burnt, up, burnt out from the, the whole music industry with, with how the label was, you know, moving it along and stuff. And uh, so, yeah, but for really, for the majority of those years, I was in a recording studio. Now there was one P 
period where um, I, I was really frustrated because we weren't getting, a lot of it was waiting for Chris to write lyrics and stuff. And, and I was getting frustrated because let's get broke, man. It was like, dude, we haven't done anything in like two, almost two years, you know? It wasn't like I, we were getting massive, like there were no residual royalty checks coming in and we didn't sell enough records. Not, um, not, even, for boy, not even for Boys of Summer as a single. No, that was written by um, uh, Don Henley and uh, the dude from Tom Petty. Well, the, the way the way I see it though is like like the so the 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 song that's written is the land, but the your cover of it, your version of it, it's still it's still a house that you've built on the land. I, right, and we built another one for Don Henley. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's basically what happened. Man. Which, which is fine you know listen it, it definitely helps in a lot of records i mean at one point you know i was really of course paying attention when the label we would get the reports and we're selling 20 30 000 copies a week and i was like what mm -hmm. you know to me that was just unheard of to be able to sell that many records at once that's yeah that's um that's pretty amazing and I, I you know i saw chris uh four years ago um and he still plays Boys of Summer, which, you know, more power to him, but I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't quite believe it because I, I would have thought that would be done, done to death. Um, the, was this around the time, like you mentioned, like, you know, it's not like you have a fixed salary. Uh, you might start having to look at side hustles. I know a lot of musicians get uh, session musician jobs, teaching jobs, um, songwriting jobs, production jobs. Was this around the time when you were kind of wanting to, talk to Chris about, uh, you know, we've got we've to change the way we do things, basically. Well, uh, no, but what happened was, this is how things really changed, was that, uh, I can't remember, it might have been in late 2000, sometime in 2006, we needed to go out and do something, and we didn't really want to go out. Like, we did a few shows in England. We actually did that uh, Give It a Name yep. uh, yeah, yeah. thing, which was massive, you know, we, we were the main support for uh, my chemical romance which was bizarre but that that uh, as that alludes a lot to what i what that quote you used to me about the brand of the ataris mm. right i want to get back to that but that like so we were playing with a bunch of new people right uh at that given a name which was a massive couple of shows and we were playing right before uh my chemical romance okay that's a great placement for the brand of the Ataris, okay. So, but uh, in between any of that, Chris and I wound up going on an acoustic tour. Our booking agent allowed us to go book our own acoustic tour. So it was just him and I in his neon Dodge Neon with a little DVD player in it. It was ridiculous. But him and I literally drove around the country and we played, and it was, it was pretty awesome. It was really, everybody was cool. Let us keep our own money. We had, we, we made a decent amount of money doing that. And that, at that moment, I think struck in Chris's mind that he said, he didn't say it to me, but I know that he was thinking like, I can do it myself. We, we don't need these people, right? We're, but this is before we knew that Welcome to the Night wasn't going to work. But I think he knew right then. So when we, when Welcome to Night came out, it tanked, you know, then um, that label went under within like a couple of months. So we were on our own. Yeah. So at that point, it was like, what are we going to do? And he said to Darren, our manager and our agent, hey, let us go and do some more touring on our own. We just need to get some money and, and just kind of do our own thing and try to figure it out. So we did that for the remainder of 2007. And it was, it was tough. Now, it wasn't tough because I was afraid to go get back in a van or any of that stuff. Like, because we were in a bus just a few months before that. That was cool, but it was the, it was literally grinding, playing shows and driving and, and, and it was bad. Like, we were doing it. So it wasn't always a good show. And then he started getting into the fact like, well, we can play anywhere, man. I'll play anywhere. Like, he would play in a house. He would play in a garage. He would play, uh, you know, in a theater. Like, mm -hmm. I think he just loved the freedom of it. And, and that to me was burning me out. So at the end of that in 2007, the last show we did as a tour, um, 
I said to him, look, you know, come back to New York. We were in Pennsylvania. I said, come back to New York. It's not that far. I had, we had already started working on a couple ideas that were more punk rock. We're like, screw it. Let's just go back and just be a band. We could cut down band members if we wanted. We could do whatever we want, but let's go back and do this. And let's try and send the stuff to Brett Gerwitz. Because at that time, Brett was, um, I think they signed Alkaline Trio or cl- somewhere around that time. One of those bands from our, our time was signing with Epitaph. And Chris knew Brett. So I was like, this is a perfect match for us. Let's write something that's us. Like, you know, back a, a step back. And, and let's see if we'll, we can go on Epitaph. Like that to me, even fat, that to me was really appealing. And he wound up going back to Indiana. And I thought to myself, he's never going to, if I can't reel him, if I can't get him reeled in right now, he's never going to come back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we're going to always be doing this. Like, because it's just sort of Chris's nomad life. You know, that's, that's what he does. And so in April, why I left was because, you know, just because the band was operating the way we wanted it to operate, the business side of the band was still there. The bills were still there. Uh, we were involved in some lawsuits in the past, not by any fault of the band, but just just stupid crap. And that was looming over us. And, you know, it was just my manager was calling me all the time, telling me, like, you know, all these problems that we had. And then, and then if I try to come up with a solution, he was like, well, the only solution is to write a new record. And I'm like, well got to get Chris on board and just we couldn't get on board together so I just knew at that point it was time to bail there was nothing gonna happen until you know what I mean Mm -hmm. so that was it in April of 08 I played my last show and I didn't even say goodbye to him he just he bolted I went my other way and that was it and then we had some you know we had some business problems still to attend to and I was angry with him for many years because of some of them just because you know there was just some loose ends we need we never really got to tie up i wound up doing it myself but like that was frustrating but um yeah it, it, as you can see right it never stopped right so whatever he did after that he continued to do on his own and and can still do it right uh, surprising to you or even to me at times when he plays some of these old songs and he had this is a guy who is a prolific songwriter yeah. Like this is a guy who could sing. Like he's, like I'm, I'm not gonna say the band names, but there's some band names out there that from our genre that still are popular to this day. Like singers are god awful singers. They're terrible, but they they're still doing it. Like and this guy has talent. It's just like, uh, so we eventually we did the reunion tour, and um, I hadn't talked to him in almost five years. And uh, the funny thing about all these guys is that once I start talking to them, it's like like we were like together yesterday like there's really no time lost but uh, you know I put away all my the shit the animosity to the side it was like whatever at that point I didn't care that tour was the best tour we one of one of the best tours we've ever done together in terms of getting along in terms of making money actually making money not having to give it all away you know running it as smoothly as we could and um, um, what it came down to is the day before, one of the last days of the tour, because I didn't really, Chris traveled on his own. I traveled on my own. Mike flew to every show. Kid flew to most of the show. Oh, yeah, we were, and that's why it worked so well, because <laughs> we weren't really surrounded by each other all the time. But when, when it was like showtime, we were like amped. You know what I mean? We were happy yeah. to see each other, and it was cool to play. But Chris and I spoke and he had told me he was interested in maybe continuing to do this. And I said, okay, that's great. So um, one of the last shows that we had, I sat and talked with him because I, I, and I just, uh, I never like to give anybody advice. It's like, Hey, but this is what, why your video was a bit appealing to me too, was <clears throat> I just said to him, listen, we can do then This is 2014. Right. I said, we, we can continue to do this. We could do this. Uh, we didn't even cover all of America and the tour was pretty successful. Yep. Um, we still could have done the South. We could have done England. We could have done, we had an offer to do Australia. We could have slowly, surely. And I know that was his full-time gig. 
And I said, Chris, you're talented enough to just go out and be Chris Rock. Be a singer-songwriter, play with anyone you want. That means that you can maybe get Mike Carrera, he's friends with Mike Carrera, he's friends with a bunch of different dudes. It's like, get a power group together. Like, be, make a country record, make a metal record, right? Now you don't have the pressure anymore of being the Ataris. The Ataris, to me, was the brand. You put the brand aside, and we work on that slowly. But in the meantime, you just do whatever you want. Play, it to, play Atari songs, of course, but like, bill it as yourself. But then we try to slowly but surely maybe write some music, maybe play some shows here and there. See what happens. There's no, pre no pressure anymore, right? And uh, I felt like that was a pretty honest assessment to, at the time, the situation. And he didn't do it. <laughs> so, you know, I think he's scared of, of anyone uh, tearing him. It's like, I would say control freak, but in some ways not. Like, I not. Would say, yeah, he, seem, he seems like it. When I saw that video of him throwing the equipment to, at Rob, I mean, I don't want to talk too badly about him because he's not here to No, that's hysterical. But when I saw it, I, th I didn't think anything twice about it. I was like, yeah, that's Chris. <laughs> I mean, he, he didn't do that with us, but he would, I've seen him get pissed off before. Like, you know, the first show, you know, the funny thing about it was the first show that we played in Phoenix on the reunion tour, mm -hmm. I think we were all surprised at how rowdy the show was and how great it was. And we were playing the last song. Don't even remember what we were playing, but you know, it was beautiful just to see a crowd and be there with these guys. And he came over to me and he just yelled in my ear. He's like, Hey, should I throw the drums at Chris after this, after this song? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> he has a sense of humor. That's for sure. Um, that, that final, that, that tour you, you did, it, it sounds amazing because there's less crew because you're all traveling separately. Everyone's, going their own separate ways. There's, there's less overhead because everyone's sorting their own flights. You don't have to rent a, 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 a bus or anything like that. It sounds really good. And, and was, your, was your view when you, when you spoke to him on that final tour, was it that, you know, the Ataris is so important and it was back then, you know, everyone thought that it was going to be lumped in with Simple Plan and Good Charlotte and Bowling for Soup and these other, uh, and even like Millen Collin and Lagwagon, these bands are still absolutely crushing it. MXPX, I know that Chris recently went out and actually supported MXPX a couple of years ago. Um, it's almost like, yeah, it could have been one of them, but it's almost become sort of like, a, I don't want to say like an Atari's cover band, but when you four are together, you know, doing the so long a story of shows, it feels real. And when it's not, it feels like Chris Rowe of the Ataris or the Chris Rowe show. Yeah, no, uh, 100%. I've always thought, um, and a friend of mine had summed it up for me perfectly, that Chris would always jump over a dollar to make a dime. <laughs> it just didn't make sense to me why he would do those things. For, for example, play you had alluded to a show you went to that when you walked in the door, he's playing, mm -hmm. right? The Atari, the Ataris are playing at two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. He's playing. And I'm just being honest. And I mean, this isn't even about arrogance or cockiness. Some of the other bands that were probably on that bill, the Ataris probably sold way more records than had done way more stuff than, and that's why I say, even when we did give it a name, we played with an entirely different bunch of dudes played a lot of different style of music and we were still playing right before my chemical romance. Wow. We played after thrice. We played after a We played after all these great bands, yep. but because the band had meaning, it had value. And, and that was really what I was aiming to do was to try and put value back. And even I tell him, and I know it, may, it, it you know, I'm sure he, he didn't like it. And of course I get it, but it's like, so I was trying to tell him like, I want you to do stuff that's valuable to the band name and for yourself. I mean, you know, but I think Mike had alluded to a lot of stuff like that. He just, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what it is. Why he, in, he just, I think he just likes to do the nomad thing. I like think he just likes cruising around in a van and just playing to anywhere and everything. Like he, he, it's, you know, I think 
I don't know. He doesn't I, I would say it's a bit of a pure, pure tr- punk rock spirit, but at the same time, I know Chris is a lot like me when it comes to money. Like, if we get money, it's gone. <laughs> like, yeah. He loves to spend it, too. So it's like, I know he doesn't want to be broke, and I'm sure he is. And I don't know what he is, but, like... <laughs> He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to answer to anyone. It sounds like the way you described it, because I was always confused. I was always like, I my two big questions when we started talking was a, all right, why would you not immediately go? Because every band who leaves a record like RCA, they try and sign with Interscope or Epitaph the next year, right? But you covered that. You said, you know, you did have conversations, uh, but Chris was like, you know no, 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 like, I don't mind. I'm cool doing it this way because you went from major labels paying for you to, like, tour around in a bus or fly to different countries and all of this stuff. And then he's like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good with the van. I'm good with, with the car. And even that, that stressful situation in, in Venice, you know, in, in that instance, there, maybe if the situation was different, you, there'd be someone you could quickly phone call and they'd be like, don't worry. Cause I used to, before I, you know, do what I do now, I used to be a, a personal assistant in a big finance company. Um, I know that, you know, if you've got the right connections, how easy it can be, pick up the phone. Don't worry. We've got you on the next flight to New York. Don't worry. We've got you and, and stuff. It's, um, but, but Chris has this attitude of, uh, no, 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 this is good. This is good. I like doing it. I think he likes, I think he does like chaos in some ways. He's, yeah. Well, I, the, the, like I said, though, the, the problem was is that the level that we got, which wasn't obviously that big, but it was bigger than what it was, there, there was no money. Mm. The money was just, we, were, we poorly made that happen. There were other bands I know that did our level, some even lower, that did very well monetarily. But for us, we were horrendous when it came to money and we didn't have it and so i think when i was with them on the uh i did the first tour i worked with them was on a lag wagon vandals tour they were opening this was in 1990 no this was in 2000 when end this forever just came out 2000 2001 i met right before it was a it was a tour before i joined them on war tour great tour right see lag wagon every night see the vandals every night amazing the ataris were opening they were outselling these guys these other bands and merch i'm talking like 10 grand 15 grand a night My God. It, it was insane and again there's no manager there's no business manager there's no tax fee these guys are taking pure cash and just divvying it up and 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 making this this crazy circus that they had created be able to move from place to place so i think that see you babe Oh, wife's going to work. <laughs> so I think that's what he got accustomed to. Um, hey, he had no real issues when we did the uh, reunion tour. I mean, we played House of Blues. How much can't get any more corporate than that? I love you know what I'm saying? And the shows were great. I've seen so many good bands at the House of Blues. Alkaline Trio, Against Me, uh, Oh Wonder. Like, that's, I think if you're a punk rock band, that's like the venue, because like like you said, uh, uh, who was it? Like you, you mentioned, Chris about Chris like getting a, a super group together. Um, bands like you know Goldfinger and uh, all these bands who have now become sort of like a super group because yeah, um, that's exactly the route that Chris could have gone down. And and what's cool is uh, Goldfinger are very smart because outside of what they're doing, they all have very very good respective careers in not only other bands but songwriting youtubing whatever it is they're doing and it's really cool to see that but the 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 tours they go on i think the one cool thing which you mentioned as well like supporting other bands i don't think that in my opinion the Atari's should try and go out and do these headline shows without the OG lineup um, and, you know, play these small venues. Instead, you know, why not do what you were doing before, supporting tours? So many bands are so successful just doing supporting tours and festivals and warp tours. I spoke to Michael from Issues a couple of weeks ago. They they don't really headline, but they, they play it like Wembley because they're, they will, they'll play Wembley Stadium, but they'll just support Bring Me the Horizon. And Goldfinger, <laughs> Goldfinger will support whoever, like 
yellow card or real big <laughs> fish or less than Jake. And they'll play these huge venues because why go and see less than Jake when you can see less than Jake, yellow card and Goldfinger like all in the same way. Right. It draws a huge crowd. You play much bigger venues, which are like 2,000, 3,000 people rather than, and I'm not exaggerating, Chris has played 200 to 500 capacity venues. I think um, like another example, we came as Romans, uh, they do headlining tours, but they, they also support these huge bands um, like I Prevail and play amphitheaters and do all this cool stuff. I think um, if I was to speak to Chris, you know, I'd be like, dude, like, I want to come and see you and play, see you play a 45 minute set. And then I want to see, you know, other bands who you hang out with and maybe even come out and do a song with them or something. That would be really cool. I mean, I'm sure you would do something like that. I don't know, like, like we, I still speak with all these guys, you know, on online and stuff. A little, little more uh, in the last couple months than I have in, in, since, in, since the last tour, you know. And that's just time, you know what I mean, and just life. I actually ran into him in Manhattan. Wow. Yeah, so I, yeah, I ran into Chris in Manhattan. He was, he was playing. <clears throat> So you asked what I was doing now. I, um, for almost six years now, I'm a travel consultant for, for touring bands, which is just a fancy word for a travel agent. But I have, uh, that's what I do 24 <laughs> seven. I book flights and hotels and cars with lots of bands, you know, <laughs> and, um, I went to go meet up with the tour manager there to, it was actually the Dropkick Murphys. Wow. Cool. I, went to, I went to meet up with their TM to see about, you know, uh, working with him. And lo and behold, this was a like a three-story venue. Mm -hmm. uh, they were playing upstairs in the big room. And then in the, 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 there's a real small room. And then there's a medium room. In the medium room, Chris is playing a tour with Paul Thorne Heights. Oh, wow. That's this was like four or five years, four, four or five years ago. Yeah. I literally show up and I'm waiting outside for, for, uh, I knew a crew guy from drop kicks for, he's, I, I used to, uh, work on Slipknot stuff. So uh, he worked with Slipknot and I became friendly with him. He, he was going to come down and give me a bracelet as I'm waiting for him. I see this, I see this guy walking down the street eating a sandwich and it's Chris Rowe. Oh my. That was hysterical. I didn't see him for like maybe a year and a half since the last, you know what I mean? So it was kind of funny to run. And I had a good night. I actually hung out with him for a while. Like, that's the thing. Like, if I get together, like, he's a funny dude, man. He cracks me up. He's got some crazy stories. And he's lived uh, an, an insane life. I mean, <laughs> a lot of it from his own doing, of course. But, like, uh, yeah, these all those guys in the band were absolute characters i mean yeah it's really it's it's amazing it's really cool like you know you've all landed on your feet and everyone's everything sort of works out for the best which is what me and mike spoke about as well that everything worked out for the best uh and yeah um that's really awesome what you're doing now as well because actually i uh, I, I did already know that you were, you were doing the travel consulting um, because I think you came up on LinkedIn or something. <laughs> uh, like that. That's really, um, that's really, really cool. And yeah, that's, that's awesome. It sounds like, you know, Chris is just doing what he loves and yeah, play, playing these, these shows, supporting Hawthorne Heights is pretty rad. I love, I love watching them live. I've seen them a while ago. Um, and I just want to go back to, uh, before we we close up uh back in 2000 and was it 2002 your first warp tour with the band was that um uh, 2001 yeah 2001 amazing yeah i mean that was a big time for music warp tour recently it's still very pop punk and punk rock but um i mean it's obviously been finished for a few years now but in the recent years before it finished uh you know it, it became more of like a, a metalcore festival because obviously they play whatever's they, they, they'll book the bands who are whatever's popular at the moment. Uh, but back then, the, the lineup um, for Warp Tour was, was killer. You know, Bouncing Souls, Lagwagon, Mill and Colin, uh, who, who else? Less than... Rancid. Rancid, yeah, Rancid. AFI. 
Mm-hmm. AF5, uh, Blink-182 did it in 2000, and then I think after that, they just were too big, I guess. <laughs> then, um, yeah. Alkaline, Alkaline Trio as well. Uh, that's, that's Me first, the gimme gimmies, yeah. And, and, I, and also, I think what you said about uh, adapting to major label and this, this touring in 2004, 2005, the cool thing about those tours, uh, like Warp Tour, is it's a bit more simple because it's you and like 45 other bands and they're, you're all your buddies and that you know where you're going. Some, most of the time, you know what time you're playing. Uh, it, it, what was your fondest memories from, from that time? And who were you like buddies with? Like, were there, was there another band who you were really good friends with or you, or you loved? You, you mentioned uh, Alien Ant Farm, who I saw back in 2016 and the crowd still go nuts when they play uh, Wish and Movies and that other track off their... Um, off yeah, their- I, did, I, I never met them. They actually got kicked off of the tour because <laughs> the singer was a wacky dude. Yeah. yeah, I guess he was mouthing off to the wrong people and they booted him. Um, but, you know, I could... Uh, warp Tour, I always wanted to go on it, right? I was like... I couldn't wait to get on Warped Tour. And then uh, doing it two times, I could say the shows were the, some of the greatest shows I ever played, right? Some shows where you're playing, there's t- eight, 10,000 people there. And, you know, and it, that's amazing. And, 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 and the good thing is, is that the stage is the same every show. So you're very familiar w- with your sound. You're f- very familiar with your surroundings. It's very regimented, the whole thing like that. Um, I didn't like sitting in a parking lot in Texas mm. at 109 when you had a shitty bus uh, or, or even when your bus was fine. That to me got very tedious and boring because like most musicians will tell you, they, the, the best part of their day is the, the half hour hour they get to play, right? And if you're, in a, if you're in a city, you have some time to wander around and, and chill. But for Warp Tour, they played a lot of fields a lot of times outside of a city and stuff like that so that was difficult um the other thing about the bands i mean maybe this will be surprising to you but for me warp tour was very clicky the very high school type atmosphere for me i thought it was i was a little older i I was like 29 so but i was i was a little older 29 30 but I, i felt like a lot of the bands that i loved um, they, they already had like their kind of niche kind of thing going on. And like, you know, they weren't really, I didn't find a lot of the bands that I loved to be like, and I love these bands to be ultra friendly <laughs> or, or willing to want to expand their friendship to whatever gang of people they already had. Oh, that's um, so to be honest with you, I, I kind of think back about what tour and think, who did I hang out with? I hung out with a lot of crew dudes from other bands. Yeah, that's that's crazy. so i met a lot of crew guys um and not even to tn i'm talking about crew guys like guitar guys and, and drum techs and stuff like that man that's really who i wound up hanging out with a lot and uh other than friends that we would have come from all over you know what i mean so orlando i'd have friends come in feel like every show there was friends so i didn't feel the whole camaraderie love of warp tour and you know the thing is is that i think you I think there are cases where you can see some bands and what didn't happen to the Ataris, but some bands do get bullied on that tour by other bands. Um, And it's actually, it's out there. Like there's, it's known fact that some bands actually do get bullied pretty badly. And if you piss off the wrong person who may even be an asshole or, or actually in the wrong, you're still can get yourself in trouble on that tour. So as cool as it was, and by the way, Kevin Lyman is the best guy in the world. Like he's the greatest. That dude, you know, it's like, he's too nice. Like just think of how many bands come up to him every day back then. Can I play? And he would be like, yeah, sure. Like, you know what I mean? That guy was the most giving dude ever, except for in 2003, he, I think he lowballed us. (laughs) Uh, Cause we didn't make shit on that tour. Like some, some bands make a lot of money. We didn't, we, you make a lot of money in merch, but in terms of, like a, a guarantee, we shouldn't have did it in 2003. We should have just, you know, some bands only do a piece of it. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. like do their own tour. We should have did that. But we were like, I think we love the concept of Warp Tour, but once you're out there, I'm like, oh, 
I love the shows. I love, I love the people that work it. Uh, I'm still friends with my stage guy, one of my stage like the guys that they would be the uh, Brian stage. The Mike uh, it was, was one of the assistants on the Brian stage. I'm still friends with him to this day. So like Amazing. there's that, but when it comes to bands, I, yeah, <laughs> I don't really know. I can't tell you that I, I have a Rolodex of old band members from from bands that I hung out with. It was just, uh, Man, that's, yeah. That's I don't know. Weird. I'm not I'm not surprised about the 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 quote beef on on the tour because I I have heard that like Amity Affliction and Memphis May Fire had some back in like 2013 or 2014 or something and. Um, I saw the Orlando stop because my parents used to have a house in uh, Kissimmee. The Orlando stop <laughs> of uh, Warp Tour was in this like parking lot that's like near uh, Winter Haven or somewhere random like that, like complete middle of nowhere, like completely. And you don't have a car because you've only got your bus and stuff. So it's, uh, I can imagine like Orlando or Texas or Southern California in the summertime in a bus. Oh, Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix, yeah, exactly. sitting around for like 10 hours just to play one show. I'm, I'm, I am surprised though, because like, you know, a lot of musicians these days, they do YouTube vlogs uh, behind the scenes of Warp Tour, day in the life of Warp Tour, day in the life uh, traveling the UK or whatever. And uh, yeah. Back then you needed to hold a big camera. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you couldn't film it. Yeah, I think, you know, people only show a highlight reel of their life. They never show everything that's going on. You never know what's going on. And speaking of which, speaking of the UK, uh, what was the biggest show or coolest place that you played in the UK? Did you ever get a chance to play uh, Brixton or is it more like uh, the four? Well, my, my first show in London was in Brixton. Oh yes, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it was cool. But of course at that time, Brixton was so sketchy. <laughs> <laughs> like the area around, I don't know if it's changed at all, but the area around it was really sketchy, man. This yeah. was uh, 2001. Uh, so it was weird to, to, I didn't really go out much around that that particular area, but because I, I, I remember some dude walking down the street, like way out of drugs, butt naked, like just strolling down the street. I remember when we were loading in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or loading out. I'm sorry, it was at night, but that was that was funny. But um, yeah, I played Brixton, it was great. But I, um, I love we played two nights in the Astoria before it was torn down, yeah. sold out. And that to me was like an accomplishment. And, and I love that just knowing all the bands that I played there. And then um, I would say, uh, I know it's, it's Scotland, but uh, Barrel Lands was cool to play a sold out show at Barrel Lands. Amazing. That's yeah. so cool. Who, who, who was the, uh, the Astoria is an incredible venue. I, I went there a couple of times before it got uh torn down and you're right so many cool bands uh same with with brixton which tours were were they were they uh headlining shows or were they the, the brixton one was a was a festival in 2001 and it was like less than jake us voodoo glow skulls i think played i think maybe 311 might have played it was a weird I have a t-shirt still of it still that i kept and it was, had some terrible goofy name like but that that was that run of shows. That was the first time I ever went out there. It was right after the Warp Tour, um, but the Barrowlands was uh, with Planes Mistaken for Stars, and the uh, Two Nights at Storia were Cursive and Planes Mistaken for Stars. Wow, yeah, that's that's, that's really cool, man. That's, oh. that's so cool. I I uh, the first time I went to a gig at Brixton Academy was I think I was fourteen years old, so two thousand four, two thousand five. And me and my brother, we walk out the venue and this big tall guy is like seven foot tall. He just walks, he doesn't even lift his hands up. He's like walking like Lurch from the Adams family. And he just goes, you want any weed boys? And we, we, were, we were like, we're 14 years old. I was like, I was like, dude, you need to read the room. And then my mom and dad literally walk around the corner because they're, you know, they're chaperoning us. Um, they, they, they've been to the theater. They've been to see a West End play whilst me and my brother go and see, I think it was like, it was either Atreyu or Weezer. I, I've been to Brixton a lot. I've seen of Mice and Men and Atreyu and uh, 
Weezer and uh, and lots of bands there. And yeah, my parents come around the corner and I'm just like, take me home. Like I was terrified. It's much better now. It's it's actually very gentrified now. Um, but I still, even to this day, I still wouldn't choose to live there because uh, <laughs> I think that scarred me for life. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I thought of the, that record label was Sanctuary. Oh, Sanctuary. And which oh, is in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Now that rings a bell. I have no idea why, but um, yeah, yeah. And their okay. office, they're, it's funny because I know hotel stuff and I'm like, their offices were really close to, um, if I can't remember, do you remember, there's a hotel called the K-West. Uh, it's in, um, um, oh my God, West, West of London is, uh, man, I'm losing my touch here. Is it, near, is, it near, is it near Hammersmith in that area? Yes, it's, it's past, it's Shepherd's Bush. Oh, lovely. Okay. I yeah, think yeah, it's I'm in gonna... Shepherd's Bush area. Um, cause yeah. that's where that, the K West, I shouldn't tell everybody, but that, that's where all the musicians stay. <laughs> Amazing. It's not a fancy place, but it's a place that there are some venues over there, right? And uh, at Hammersmith, right? Uh, so, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like Shepherd's Bush. It's got, the, it's got a couple of good venues there, and then Hammersmith has got the Apollo, and then you're not too far from, uh, there's the Half Moon in Putney, which is quite a famous venue. Uh, when you're booking a hotel like that, though, because like London hotels, not cheap. They're like eighty euros a night. I'm sp I, I speak in euros. Yeah, I speak crazy. in American dollars because people don't really understand Great British pounds. But uh, that's <laughs> um, that's not a. It, it must sometimes be a lot of overhead for a band to be staying in those places. Yep. <laughs> they sure. I actually was. I was in London a few years ago for a, a trip for work, and I actually stayed in. Uh, the hotel, the Edition, which is a really cool hotel, right, right in the middle of it all. There, and, and uh, oh my God, I'm is it like Soho and Covent Garden. This is so yeah, Soho, Mayfair, that Marlebone. I think it's in Marlebone, maybe. Marlebone, uh, nice. Yeah, it was a great. Yeah, it's right off Oxford Street, so it was uh, yeah, very expensive, but uh, yeah. Um, Wow, cool. Um, is there anything else you want to mention before we before we close up? Did I miss anything? <laughs> yeah, I get rambling. I'm like, uh, uh. no, we we did so much. I think we talked for an hour and twenty minutes. That's um, even more than I expected. Wow, that's long. You, you had some really interesting stories. Yeah, uh, there's way more, <laughs> but. I think in relevance to the, the video that you made, which I felt, you know, you, yeah. like Mike had said, it's very, very, you were, you, it's funny. Well, I talked to Mike re just recently about it and I'm like, it's amazing that we, we don't, we've never met you before, right? And uh, you were able to look at that objectively and, and nail it. You know what I mean, Dave? It's like, that, that's what was crazy about it was just like, Oh, yeah <laughs> I, I really i really appreciate that honestly yeah because i didn't want to step on anyone's toes or like get anything completely wrong because i've done that before with uh with like zebra head and stuff uh, <laughs> and, uh the, the fans the fans weren't very happy about it they were like hey you, you got this it was fine but you got this part wrong but i'm i'm really glad because uh yeah that was amazing it was just such an incredible coincidence that Mike saw it like a matter of days after he got home and uh yeah that was it was pretty amazing and like you said we could be here all night talking yeah no I could probably ramble forever talking but uh, incredible stories but like yeah the, the video was the unfortunate career of the Ataris and, <laughs> we, and and literally it it's true there have been situations where stranded in Venice or um I, I think if that thing hadn't happened, the merger between RCA and Columbia, like you said, there's a chance that if that hadn't have happened, the, the trajectory of the band and being on a major label and the promotion and the tours, it could all be completely different. Also, if they didn't allow us to do that acoustic tour, 
Oh yeah, that's and kind of kind of you know shed the light on like, hey, uh, we could do this by ourselves. Yeah, that's true. That that was a big a big game changer actually. But I think uh, yeah, that's so interesting. It's it's almost like it all fell into place. It all happened how it was supposed to happen. I guess so. I, I mean, I'd rather be. I'd still rather be touring and uh, playing, of course, than working. But <laughs> oh well. We'll see. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. I mean, it's never too late. And uh, I was, I mentioned this to Mike, it's nearly coming up on 20 years of So Long Astoria. So, you know, and, and people are commenting on my video still saying, oh, I hope we get a show soon. I hope we get a, a reunion or, you know, whatever. It, they would love to see the lineup back together. So time will tell. <laughs> time will tell. That's for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, John, for speaking to me. I'm going to get myself to bed because I'm quite a few hours ahead of you. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much. That was really awesome. It was so fun. It was even more exciting and interesting and information filled than I could have possibly imagined. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate you taking the time, man. All right. Awesome. Well, you have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much. Uh, and take care. All right. Stay in touch, brother. Thank you, Pat, for now.